Hello, Matthew Gatos here. This is part two to our curve sketching video on section 5.5. I have three examples in this video. So for the first um, example, we're going to look at this function and we're going to sketch it. This function is continuous for all real numbers, which tells me I do not have any vertical asymptotes. So the first information that I have is about the first derivative and it's equal to zero at negative two and three. So that means that at negative 2 and 3, I have potential max min points. It is non-differentiable at 0. So that means it could be a kink, a corner, cusp, or maybe a vertical tangent. We'll see what it looks like. So next piece of information. It is greater than 0. In other words, it's increasing from negative infinity to negative 2 and from 0 to 3. It is decreasing, or less than zero, between negative two and zero, and three and positive infinity. Okay, so looking at that, I can see that there is a maximum at negative two. It looks like there is a minimum at zero, and a max at three. So still don't know what's happening at zero. We'll figure that out with our second derivative. So our second derivative is zero at five and one. So that means that there is a point of inflection there. Now we look at, it says there's no other place that it's zero, but if you look at where the second derivative is above zero and below zero, there's another point of zero that we need to consider. So we're going to consider that point zero as well. So intervals of concavity. It is greater than zero, concave up, between five and positive infinity. It is concave down between negative infinity zero and zero and five. Ah, now I can see what's happening at zero. At x equal to zero, since it's concave down on both sides, there is a cusp. Okay, so let's graph what we have. So I'm going to start with my inflection point. I have an inflection point at 5 and 1. And then I'll graph my maxes and mins. Again, because I don't have the y values, I'm just estimating where those are. Um, so all your graphs could be different depending on how high or how low you went. So I have a max at negative 2 and 3. So at negative 2 I have a max. So let's say, I don't know, there. And at 3, I also have a max. And then I have a minimum at 0, which is my cusp. Okay, to finish in the rest of the graph, I'm going to look at my concavity. So it is concave down below 0. So below 0, I'm going to come up to my max, and I'm going to come down. So that's all concave down. It's also concave down between 0 and 5, so at my inflection point here. So it's going to come up to the max and go through my inflection point. And then moving forward, it's concave up. So it could be something like that, concave up. That's just an example, one example of what the graph might look like. Okay, so let's try some where we have to come up with a graph given the first derivative, the second derivative, and of course the original function. So to start this off, I always start with my original function. I have f of x is equal to x times 2 minus x. So in this example, I have a domain restriction because I cannot take the square root of a negative. So I know that 2 minus x has to be greater than or equal to 0. We're adding x to both sides x has to be less than or equal to 2. So what that means is that I am starting, because it's radical, I'm starting at 2 and it's everything below, which means nothing in here will exist. Okay, so let's look at intercepts. I'll let x be 0, so I have y equals 0 times 2 minus 0, so that's just 0. So I have an x and a y intercept at 0, 0. I do not have any vertical asymptotes or horizontal asymptotes or slant asymptotes because this is not a rational function. Okay, let's figure out if it is even or odd. So I'll look at f of negative x, which is negative x, the root of 2 minus negative x. So negative x and then 2 plus x. Now, since that does not equal to 
f of x, I'm going to factor a negative 1 and see if that works. So if I factor a negative 1, I'm left with x times 2 plus x. And that is not f of x either. So what that tells me is that it is neither even nor odd. So there is no symmetry about the axes. Okay, so that's really all I can tell from my first derivative, or sorry, from my original function. So let's go to my first derivative. So you see I can have on my graph the things I found from my original function. Now, for the first derivative, I can find out intervals of increase and decrease. So to do that, I want to factor my first derivative. So I'm going to take out a negative 1 because I want my leading coefficient to be positive. And then I'll look at that over 2 times the square root of, again, factoring out a negative 1. And then I'm left with x minus 2. Okay, so now that it's all factored, I can look at intervals of increase and decrease. So in the numerator, this negative 1 will always be negative. So in all of my intervals, it is negative. If I look at 3x minus 4, that's 0 at 4 thirds. So to the left, the factor is negative, and to the right, the factor is positive. Then I'll look at 2 on the bottom. So 2 is always positive. And I'll look at the root. So because I am restricting my domain, this root will always be positive. So I'm restricting the domain so that this interval actually does not exist. And so by restricting the domain, my root will always be positive. So here I have two negatives, which tell me that I have an increasing function. And here I have one negative, so it is decreasing on that interval. So writing out the intervals of increase and decrease, it is increasing from negative infinity up to 4 thirds, and it is decreasing from 4 thirds to 2. So because I have a change, I'm increasing to the left and decreasing to the right of 4 thirds, that means I have a maximum at 4 thirds. So I have a maximum at x equal to 4 thirds. So let's figure out what the y value is by putting it into the original equation. So 4 thirds and then the root of 2 minus 4 thirds. So we can just simplify this. So if I do that, I have 4 thirds times the root of, so 2 take away 4 thirds, 2 is 6 thirds, take away 4 thirds is 2 thirds. So what I'm really going to have is I'm going to have 4 root 2 over 3 root 3. I'm just going to leave it like that um, because I'm just graphing it. So I have it at 4 thirds and at 4 root 2 over 3 root 3. That would be my maximum. Okay, so looking at my maximum, it's going to be at about 1.3 and 1.1. So 1.3 and 1.1 right about there is my maximum. Okay, so getting even more information, I'm going to look at the second derivative to look at intervals of concavity. So here you can see I have my intercepts, my start point, my maximum, and my domain restriction all accounted for. So looking at the second derivative, I want to factor my second derivative. So 3x minus 8 in the numerator over 4 times the root, or actually I'll just leave it as 3 halves. Let's try that again. So I've got 4 times, and I'm going to factor out the negative 1, x minus 2 now, all to the 3 halves. Okay, so I have critical values, or sorry, key values at 8 thirds and 2. So let's look at the intervals there. So because I have that original domain restriction that x has to be less than or equal to 2, I'm going to just get these intervals gone. So it's really only one area that I need to look at. So looking at 3x minus 8, that was 0 right here. So to the left, it will be negative. Now 4 will always be positive. And then because I've restricted my domain, my root is always going to be positive and because I can't have negative. So 
when I cube that, it will still stay as positive. So I have one negative there, which means that I am concave down on that interval. So my intervals of concavity, concave down from negative infinity to 2. So since that's my only interval, I have no point of inflection because I'm not changing from positive to negative. So looking at my graph now, I know that to the left of 2, I'm just concave down. So coming up to the maximum, going through the x-intercept, and just going down. That should be what my graph looks like. So again, I always like to look at these on the calculator just to see if I've done that correctly. And you can see on the calculator, this is what the graph looks like, so it looks like I did a good job. So this one was different than the last ones because of that domain restriction. This next example is also different than the ones that we did before. Let's see where it's different. So looking at, again, the original function. First thing that I notice is that I have a domain restriction that x cannot be 0. So that means I have a vertical asymptote at x equal to 0. So let's just look at the behavior around my vertical asymptote. So I'm just going to factor my function. So looking at f of x, I have, well I guess I can't really factor it. I've got 2x cubed plus 1 all over x squared. So to figure out what my values that make it 0 are undefined, well, x equal to 0, that's my vertical asymptote. And then I just set my numerator equal to 0. So 2x cubed plus 1, I set that equal to 0. So I have 2x cubed equals negative 1. Divide both sides by 2, and I've got x cubed equals negative 1 half. So therefore, I have x taking the cube root. It is the cube root of negative 1 half. So that's why I have this on my number line. So that also is the x-intercept. So I can write that down as well for the x-intercept. So negative the cube root of a half and 0 is my x-intercept. So that's at about negative 0 0.8. So right about there, I have an x-intercept. But let's look at the behavior about my vertical asymptote. So in the numerator, we know that that's 0 right there. So to the left, it will be negative and to the right it will be positive. And then in the denominator, since I'm squaring it, it will always be positive. So always be positive. And I just missed my other one here. Okay, so on either side of the vertical asymptote, let's look at what's happening. So here I have two positives. So that means to the left of my vertical asymptote, I'm going to be going towards positive infinity. So to the left of my vertical asymptote, I'm going towards positive infinity. On the other side, I have two positives, so I'm also approaching positive infinity. So I can come up here and note that as well. Okay, so let's look to see if we have um, a horizontal asymptote or a slant asymptote. So looking at the degree of the numerator, my degree is 3. The denominator, my degree is 2, and the difference between those is 1, which means I do have a slant asymptote, not a horizontal asymptote. So I have no horizontal asymptote. So let's use long division to figure out what my slant asymptote is. And also, if you didn't recognize that there was a slant asymptote, you would catch that with the long division, and I'll show you how. So x squared into 2x cubed plus 1. So 2x cubed divided by x squared is 2x. So 2x times x squared is 2x cubed. Subtract those, and I'm left with a remainder of 1. So what that tells me is that my original function, 2x cubed plus 1 over x squared, is the same as 2x plus 1 out of x squared. So this is my horizontal asymptote. So since it is not a number value, that would tell you, oh, that's not a horizontal asymptote, that is a slant asymptote. So if you didn't recognize it in the beginning, you would see it when you do long division. So I have a slant asymptote at 2x, and this is my end behavior to figure out if I'm above or below. So 2x, let's come up with a sketch of that. So I'm going to pass through when x is 0, it's 2 times 0. When x is 1, it's 2 times 1. When x is negative 1, it's 2 times negative 1. So it's kind of looking like that. So we have our slant asymptote. Let's just draw going through like that. Okay, and then we'll label that. 
So let's look at the behavior about the slant asymptote. So I want to look at the limit as x approaches positive infinity of this. So if I put in a positive number and square it, it's still positive. So 1 over a positive is just positive. So that means on the right end, as I approach positive infinity, I will be above my slant asymptote. So like that. Let's look at the other side. So the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 1 over x squared. So again, if I put in a negative number and I square it, it will be positive. And 1 over a positive is a positive. So I know at the left end, as I approach negative infinity, I will also be above. Okay, so let's check now for, I'll write this down here, even and odd. Okay, so to figure out even and odd, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at f of negative x. So that's 2 negative x cubed plus 1 over negative x squared. So f of negative x equals negative 2x cubed plus 1 over x squared. So that is not f of x, so I'm going to try and factor out a negative 1. So f of negative x equals factoring out a negative 1. I would be left with 2x cubed minus 1 all over x squared. Now that is also not f of x, so that means that these are neither even nor odd. Okay, so what we're going to do next is look at the first derivative and see how that impacts the graph. Okay, so looking at the first derivative, this is going to tell me my intervals of increase and decrease. So let's start by factoring the first derivative. So in factoring the first derivative, I'm going to take out a GCF of 2 over x cubed. Okay, so factoring that a little bit further, I'm going to factor that as 2. This is a difference of cubes. x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1 all over x cubed. Okay, so in the numerator, I have um, a critical value of 1, and in the denominator, I have a value of 0, not a critical value, but I still need to include it in my testing. Remembering, again, this is your vertical asymptote. So looking at this, I have 2, which is positive in all of the sections. I have x minus 1, which is 0 here, and to the left, it's negative, to the right, it's positive. This quadratic here, <clears throat> excuse me, will always be above the x-axis, so it is always going to be positive. And then x cubed in the denominator is 0 at 0, so to the left it's negative and to the right it's positive. So looking at my first interval, I have two negatives, which means it is increasing. I have one negative here, which means it's decreasing. And all positives, which means it's increasing. So the intervals of increase are from negative infinity to 0 or from 1 to positive infinity. And then the intervals of decrease are between 0 and 1. So what that tells me is that I have, because this is the vertical asymptote, I have a minimum at 1 because it's decreasing to the left and increasing to the right. So to find out what my minimum is, it's a minimum at x equal to 1. Go to your original function and figure out what f of 1 is. So 2 times 1 cubed plus 1 all over 1 squared. So that will be 3 over 1, which is just 3. So I have a minimum at 1 and 3. So I can put that on my graph as well. 1 and 3 right there is a minimum. So to finish this question off, I want to look at my intervals of concavity with the second derivative. So you can see here I have everything that we figured out so far. Now we're just going to do the second derivative, which is just 6 over x exponent 4. So a nice easy one. So that is 0. And there again is the vertical asymptote. 0 here. So 6 is always positive. And this here is also always positive. 
because I'm raising it to the exponent of 4. So since it's positive on both sides, I know I'm concave up on both sides. So concave up from negative infinity to 0 or from 0 to positive infinity. So since I'm only concave up, that means that I have no point of inflection. So putting this all together, the vertical asymptote here at 0, to the left I'm concave up. So I'm going to connect my end behavior, go through my x-intercept, and connect my other end behavior. So concave up there. Then I'm going to look at here. And this has been shifted over. This was actually supposed to be over there. Let me just fix that for you. Okay, that's supposed to be over there. There we are, because they were above on both. So if I'm concave up here, I'm just going to go like this down through the minimum and then continue up. So that is what the graph should look like. Again, always a good idea just to check that on the graphing calculator to see if we're in the region of being right. And you can see on the calculator, that looks very reasonable. Okay, so this graph was different because we had a slant asymptote. So now you've seen examples where we have domain restriction for a radical and an example where we have a slant asymptote. So when you're graphing, um, make sure you label all those points. Use some graph paper because I see when you have graph paper, you must be plotting something. You guys can do your practice questions in the textbook. I hope that this second video on curve sketching helped. If you have any questions, let me know.